Nick, what up, man? How about those names I just rattled off? Yeah, that that's quite the uh, that's quite the collection there. A lot of uh, former former uh, quarterback jerseys that I have in my old closet. <laughs> you got a you got a Todd Collins jersey? <laughs> I have a I have a Brad Johnson jersey. That was one. I think that was one of my first ones I got. That's not a bad one, dude. I, I mean, not to overanalyze something that happened twenty five years ago, but Snyder's insistence on running Brad Johnson out of town to let Jeff George get a crack at things really should have been uh, letting us know. Well, what direction Jeff, this thing was headed? Hey, Brad Johnson did <laughs> yeah. go on and win the Super Bowl, though. I know, I know. Um, all right, Nick. So we are three games into the Jaden Daniels era. Obviously, he wrote a uh, he he changed the script with his performance Monday night. Um, where are you at as eye test analytics test? Yeah, I'm I, I'm extremely kind of pleased with where we are through three weeks. Um, you know, after the first two games, I, I was a little – I had a little concern. There was some stuff kind of showing up on film where, you know, he was missing some stuff downfield. But, you know, that's kind of to be expected from a, a quarterback after two starts. It, it was some more stuff you would expect a, a, you know, kind of veteran quarterback to hit. But um, some of the stuff like, you know, him constantly scrambling, not really looking to throw any scramble was, was a bit of a problem for me. But, you know, Monday night was a complete flip of that. And, and he kind of answered a lot of questions there with, you know, when he was scrambling, he was scrambling to throw. Um, and it saved him from getting hit. Um, it, it converted some big first downs. And, you know, he's always going to be a threat in the running game. So I, I think he's further along than what I where I thought he would be. Um, and that's just incredible for, you know, three starts. <laughs> it, it really is wild. And we just played some Aaron Rodgers audio from his weekly McAfee session. And the thing I've been preaching – Throughout this process, I really think Daniels is a pocket passer. He <clears throat> beats you from the pocket, and it just so happens to be he can break break you off, break off an eighty yard run too. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rogers talked about how, how he won in Cincinnati from the pocket. I think there's more of that to come. I, I'm curious what your research and and analysis shows. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, at LSU, he he was. I mean, obviously, we saw the game breaking speed at LSU, but he wanted to win within the pocket, and, and I think his best plays were, were the deep balls. And that's what he was great at at LSU. Um, and you see it sometimes. And it kind of led to some of the high sack numbers that he did want to win within the pocket, maybe a little bit, you know, too much. Um, and there was some stuff kind of on the film that showed that he was maybe kind of missing some things. But again, when you have his kind of um, game-breaking speed, the the kind of mindset that he has right now of still trying to win within the pocket it is a good thing to have. I, I mean, again, trusting yourself within the pocket and not – putting yourself in unnecessary situations is a very good thing. I mean, we see it a lot with, with young quarterbacks that have that kind of um, speed and, and, you know, out of structure ability that they want to, they want to rely on that. Um, and and Jaden through three games has not really relied on that as much, uh, especially on Monday night. He, he was looking to, when it did break down and he did have to get out of the pocket, he was still looking to throw. Um, and that's a huge step forward. Well, well that be like, like you look at him, like you said, in, in college, he wanted to, he he had the unbelievable speed, and he took some sacks because he think he can make the play. Will that be like situational? Getting certain games where you know you can get around the edge, or other games you you fear you can't, where you sit in the pocket. The other time you may take off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it, it's a thing that he's going to have to kind of learn through experience, and we're going to see some. I mean, we saw some sacks, the bad sacks that he took in in the first two weeks, where you know he thinks he can get around some stuff and some annoying ones where he doesn't throw it away and, and loses a couple of yards, but um, it, it's all kind of a, a learning experience right now. Um, and in college, obviously it, it's a lot easier for him to, you know, break contain and, and, you know, force missed tackles in the backfield downfield. Um, so it's all kind of a learning experience right now. And, you know, the fact that he's not relying on, you know, constantly just kind of putting his head down, looking to run, um, is, is a huge sign for me and one I was not expecting three weeks in. Nick, let me ask you this question. So we a lot of times we always say the guy's going to learn. What's the optimal time for a rookie guy to begin to hit get those things hit? Is it sometime during the first year or do they have to be in the second, third year where they, the light bulb kind of goes off? Yeah, I mean, I, it's obviously different for every single one. And, and C.J. Stroud last year was, was obviously the exception where he just kind of hit the ground running um, right away and looked like the, the legit guy there. Um, usually you kind of see it towards the, the tail end um, of, of their rookie season. And then obviously in the second year, if they kind of haven't 
if they're in the same offense, if they don't really have it kind of figured out by then, you can kind of, you can kind of tell, but, you know, usually kind of midway towards the end of the season, you can really sort of see things start to click where, you know, they're seeing the same concept against the same coverage and whether, you know, they missed that in the first couple of weeks, they're hitting it now. That's kind of the things that I'm looking for. And you usually sort of see it from these young guys um, kind of middle of the season later towards the, the end of the year. Okay. Talking with Nick Ackridge here for Pro Football Focus. Of course, Pro Football Focus has got you covered all season long with the best data, tools, and analysis in the game. Sign up for PFF Plus today to unlock all their famous player grades and premium stats. Plus, if you're looking for fantasy tools, they got you award-winning rankings from fantasy expert Nathan Jonke. Listen, check out PFF Plus. Check out PFF. Obviously, I mean, PFF is is – part of the national football discourse at, at this point. Um, let's ask this, Nick, because I know the analytical community by and large wasn't too high on Cliff Kingsbury's offense, kind of especially going back to the Cardinals days. Um, but, you know, a lot of offenses these days are kind of predicated on motion, not a ton of it with Cliff, although I, I felt like I haven't, tra- I haven't charted it yet, but I felt like we saw more against Cincy, what do you think of the way Cliff's calling this thing through three games? Yeah, I, I've been I've been pleasantly surprised. Uh, I was was someone that was a little bit hesitant on that Cliff Kingsbury hire, just based on you know what you kind of mentioned with with him in Arizona. But it, it's not really the same offense. You know, they, they are running a lot of screens, and and I thought through the first first six quarters of the season that they were they were kind of heavily conservative um, with what they were doing, but things started to really open up and you could see it on film and in, in, in week two against the giants, whether um, you know, with that was kind of when Jaden started to really hit some stuff downfield. Um, but it was open. And, and Second stuff like half that of that had giants been open. game. Yeah. And, and stuff like that had been open in, you know, week one, we, we saw the missed shot to Terry downfield, but uh, in week two, in the beginning of the first half, there were things that you, again, I kind of mentioned earlier on that you would really want a, a kind of veteran quarterback to hit recognize. Um, and, it was just kind of a, a bad faith sort of argument to me that, you know, Cliff is always just going to run these screens and these short passes and whatnot. But I think he's got a really different offense here. I think, you know, the, the screens are, are pretty much just a run play. I, they're not as, they're not as, you know, pretty to watch as a, as a well-executed run play. Um, but it really is just kind of an extension of your running game. Get more guys out on the edge. You get a lighter box and mm-hmm. it's helped. It's helped watching this run game, which has been very, very good. Um, through three weeks, even before um, Monday night when, you know, kind of things really exploded. I think look at like Kansas City because Andy Reid ran the same stuff in Philly where he used the passing game, the short passing game, as an extension of his run. But when you look at Cliff back in uh, Arizona, he ran the football a lot. Yep. (laughs) And if he can get the runs established here with Austin and Brian Robinson, I think that takes tons of pressure off of Jaden. Yeah, and and – when you have someone like Jaden, like he had with Kyler, it, it just makes it makes things so hard on the defense. I mean, we saw it multiple times when they're going forward on fourth down and, and even in short yardage third down situations where you've got that read option threat and the defense is it, it's just almost impossible to be to be right on those plays mm-hmm. where you have that threat of Brian Robinson and then you've got Jaden keeping it. it. It just puts the defense in such a such a tough spot where in these short yardage options you've got two threats in the backfield um, and so even if you've got a loaded box there, it it's still hard for that defense to be right and win. And when they are right, they still have to go make the tackle on Jay Daniels, which uh, we saw is very, very hard to do. Yeah. Um, You talk about the screens being an extension of the run game and how well they've ran the ball. And you're correct. Um, I think Jaden, Jaden's running ability really helps in the run game in that it's 11 on 11 on every run play, rather than not having to worry about the quarterback. Um, But, Eckler might miss some time here. We don't know, but we know at least as of last night, he was still in Virginia while the team's out here in Arizona. Um, what do you make of losing Eckler to this offense? It might just be a game. We're not getting too far down the speculation hole here, but he's been really, really good for them through three weeks. Yeah, it, it's going to be a loss. Um, you know, he, he's kind of shown to, to kind of get back to, to what he was a couple of years ago with the Chargers and, um, last year he was kind of dealing with some injuries, so he, he looked not, you know, his, his same self. And um, so I, I think it's going to be a big loss. I, I mean, the the combination with him and Brian Robinson was was a great, you know, kind of different pace uh, combination between the two of them. 
Um, but I mean, it's time for someone else to step up. I, I think McNichols played well uh, in the limited snaps he got. We, we all saw the, the big pass block on the on the um, huge touchdown to Terry at the end there, and um, that's someone that's that is now just going to have to step up. And you know, you're going to deal with injuries throughout the entire year. Um, and I, I think it is a big loss, and we're going to lose it also in the kick return game. But um, you know, that just means someone else has to step up now. Sure. Um, I think, you know, McNichols has already mm-hmm. been active. Um, I, I wonder if they'd bring up Mike Wiley, who I thought looked pretty good in the preseason. Um, Nick, let's switch it over to the defensive side of the ball. Um, statistically, they rank near the bottom. I imagine your grades have them pretty close to the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, I get this question a lot, and I, I don't love answering it because it's not what people want to hear. Where do you stand on – how can this group improve? Is there some schematic thing that they can do, or do they need players to get better in a hurry? It, it's a bit, it's a mix of both. Uh, it's been rough. I mean, there's no denying that. Like you said, the the you know the raw numbers are great. Everything is is pointing towards the bottom of the league type of defense, and you know specifically in the secondary, it's rough. And, and you just you just don't really have the guys right now. Um, but one thing that's kind of given me, you know some encouragement is they are trying to switch things up. It's not just, you know, we saw in, in years past that they're just going to try to do the same thing over and over and over again. And it, if it fails, it fails. We're just going to do it again. They're trying to switch it up. Um, you know, they played, they played a lot more cover two on Monday night, um, which they were playing a decent amount, but they played almost no cover three. And, and Dan Quinn loves to run that the cover three and he he'll blitz five guys. They ran almost absolutely none of that. Um, they kind of relied on that cover two stuff. They played a lot of cover two man, which um, which definitely helped the defense. It kept Burrow to kind of dink and dunk his way down the field. But when they did switch to man, Burrow kind of carved them up. So as soon it, as it as soon that, as he saw Chase in man, he went to him. Yeah, oh, like yeah. they tried like hell not to do it, but when they did it, it was immediate. It was on site. Yeah, I mean, <clears> single <throat> high. He was seven for seven, hundred five yards and two touchdowns. I, I mean, it was. It, it was quickly. Just <laughs> the second he saw that, it was. Give me that one more it was, time. It was over for the defense. Seven for seven, 105 yards, and two touchdowns. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's the so question. They're, they're trying to switch it up. I mean, th- th- they're <clears throat> trying. And, and again, it's, it didn't work, but they are trying to switch it up. They're trying to do things that are, are putting their, their players in, in less vulnerable positions. How much will a, a, a consistent pass rush or a better pass rush help? All right. It, it would help massively. And, you know, you're kind of looking at, we all kind of knew that edge rusher was, was definitely going to take a step back, um, obviously from, from last year with losing sweat and, and young, but you're going to need more from some guys there. It's a rotational unit right now, but no one's really kind of stepped up there. And, and then, you know, interior, uh, it, it's been rough for, for Payne and Allen trying to get pressures. Um, they haven't really been up to, to what we've seen in the past. Um, and so, yeah, you, if you have a bad secondary, you, you can't have a bad pass rush as well. It's just a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's a really well way to frame that because that, Brian and I, but B, you've been saying this for a while now that like everybody loves to dunk on the secondary, yeah. but when you're not getting any pressure, what the hell is the secondary supposed to do? But Nick, I like the way you frame that. Like if one of the two groups is bad, it's bad. But if both are bad, you're in big trouble. Oh, the bad um, is atrocious. Dude, there was a. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you've already charted. I just haven't had time because I've been living in airports for 24 hours. Um, there was a play in the second half against the Bengals where they sent six, and Burrow didn't even have to move off his spot. Like yeah. on on some level, you're talking about them switching around coverages, and 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 I think they really listen. If the three of us donks are, we'll, we'll exclude Brian, Nick. If you and I, and we are just donks <laughs> that are watching tape, right? If we can identify what they should avoid with Jamar Chase, it's not like Dan Quinn and Joe Witt aren't aware of that, right? Like they know to try to stay out of man coverage on that dude. Um, but still, sometimes just motion and everything dictates it. But if you can't get home, sending six. If you can't even really impact the play, hmm. you kind of got no shot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and that's kind of why they switched things up because, you know, they, they were sending five a lot of times uh, in, in weeks one and week two, and it didn't work. They didn't get home. And then you've got, you know, corners that you don't really trust on islands out there. So hmm. they, they're going to keep switching up. They're going to try to find – clearly they're going to try to find something that works. Uh, and I think that, that kind of too high stuff where you're just going to have to live with 
you know, giving up some longer drives and kind of holding them to field goals in the end. Uh, I think that's where you're going to have to live with this defense. Um, last one. Oh boy, <laughs> where are you grading? Where, where are you grading out um, this O line? I think they've overperformed. Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, I think it's been a, a very pleasant surprise. You know, through the first two weeks, it, it probably looked better than it actually was, just because the ball was getting out so so quickly. But um, last week, it was really really good. Uh, I mean, you know. There are currently we've got um, four guys uh, over a 75 pass blocking grade, which yeah. um, doesn't typically happen with Washington O lines in the past. Um, but right now it, it's looked really, really good, um, and I think they've done a really good job kind of patching up that that you know the the left guard and center spot, which I thought was the real, real problems last year. Um, and Allegretti's come in, and in terms of pass blocking, he's been uh, you know nearly perfect. We've charged him with just one pressure given up, um, so. It, right now, that it, it's looking really good there. How, how has the young buck been uh, blocking in, based off the numbers, Coleman? Yeah, so so Coleman's been a bit up and down. Like th they're really <laughs> rotating him and Cornelius Lucas in right now. So I, I'm never a huge fan of doing that. I think guys are, are better when they kind of get a rhythm um, and, and are playing, you know, consistently. Um, so his grade right now, pass log 55.6, which is just a little bit below average, but. You know, that's kind of to be expected when you're you're not in as much. And if you're going to lose on one or two reps, it's just going to bring the grade down naturally. But um, I think he's shown some signs there that, you know, you can kind of keep going with him in the future. But I think Cornelius Lucas has also played really well. So they're kind of in a spot where they don't really want to, you know, take snaps away from Lucas, who I think has been playing a, a pretty good job and kind of giving it to Coleman. But I think they're going to keep kind of rotating them in. And I, I liked what I've seen so far from Coleman. Um, I, I would just obviously like to see more snaps. Are they in a position where they don't have to rush uh, Coleman because Lucas is playing so well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, there, there was talk about it. Coleman played a lot of guard at, at TCU as well his last year. So there were thoughts maybe he could play left guard, but they, they clearly like him as a left tackle. But with Lucas playing well and with this offense playing well, I, I understand why they don't really want to want to switch that up. Uh, Biotis has made a huge impact too. But, Nick, we got to run, man. This has been fun. Appreciate we'll have to you, do Nick. it again. Yeah, thanks, guys.